morning, Valparaiso Baptist Church. Another wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen, amen. Would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this space and this time to worship you. I pray that you would touch each and every heart here today, that we would be moved to worship you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us today? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Valparaiso Baptist Church. Thank you for coming out. Uh, man, I think the first service uh, outdid you all. They were all in the first service this morning. So, But it was good to see you guys here today. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we've got a great service in store for us this morning. We're going to trust the Lord for just a great time of worship. Uh, but first, how many of you came out and enjoyed the Memorial Day, or not, I'm sorry, the family night this last Wednesday? All right, awesome, good deal. So we decorated with uh, red, white, and blue in celebration of Memorial Day. Do we have any uh, veterans here today? Would you thank our veterans for all that they do? Thank you. God bless you guys. So with that said, uh, I just wanna put one simple thing on your radar at this moment, and that is on Father's Day, which is coming up on June the 18th, uh, we are going to have an outdoor service, something we haven't done here at our particular church location. We did an outdoor service in relation to Fall Fest last year, but we've never had a nice outdoor service here at the church. So we're going to give it a shot. We figure it's Father's Day. Let's take the men and put them outdoors where they thrive, you know. And uh, so we're going to go out there and just enjoy the great outdoors. And then after church, we're going to have a cookout. And so we are going to only have one service that day. It'll only be an 11 o'clock service, but everybody can gather. We're going to have a big event tent 
that we're going to hopefully put up with the Lord's grace. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But we're going to have an event tent, and we're going to have all of our sound equipment outdoors, and then have a fellowship afterwards. So let's just make it a fun family weekend. So pencil that in your calendars on Father's Day. We're taking service outdoor that day, okay? So with that said, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We've got two baptisms today, which is exciting. Uh, we just had a couple baptisms a couple weeks ago, and we're really excited to have some baptisms this morning. So praise God for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to trust him for the remainder of our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come here today. Lord, we want to honor you today in all that we say and do. And Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified through this worship service. Lord, as we sing these songs, as we open up the scripture, as we have our baptism, we just pray, Lord, that your hand of blessing would be upon us, that your spirit would feel the freedom to move among us, and that, Lord, you would be glorified. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and keep on singing. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart give us this day our daily bread forgive us forgive us as we forgive the ones who sin Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. as in heaven right here in my heart give us this day our daily bread forgive us forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us forgive them and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one your kingdom come it's yours it's yours all yours all yours the kingdom the power the glory are yours it's yours it's yours all yours all yours forever and ever the kingdom is yours it's yours it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. glory are yours it's yours it's yours all yours all yours forever and ever the kingdom is yours father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart
your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today. Acts chapter 2, if you want to turn there. And let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we quiet our hearts this morning, and we ask a blessing upon the word as it's preached this morning. Lord, would you be glorified through the preaching of your word? And so, Father, uh, I know that our church can be challenged by this message. We could be uh, strengthened by this message. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us do just that this morning and that your spirit would have the freedom to work among us this morning. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, today's message I've entitled Healthy Church. Healthy Church. And as you well know, and as I've probably stated many a times before, the number one reason why many people are not in church these days is because they've been there and they've done that already. Unfortunately, a great many of people have been disenfranchised by churches. And frankly, there could be any number of reasons why people have left the church. Let me just give a few examples, and maybe you can resonate with this. Maybe you've experienced something like this, or you know somebody that's experienced something like this. So maybe these will echo things that you've heard or you've felt. So for instance, many people are dis disenfranchised by what we call church hurt. And unfortunately, this happens far too often. Church hurt is when someone or some group of people in the church do something that really cuts deep into your heart and into your soul. And sometimes that pain is so deep because you feel betrayed or hurt or, or you know, there's a sense of loss going on there. That pain is so deep that some people decide to just leave. And church hurt in a nutshell, you know, uh, people will even sometimes drop church life altogether. Oftentimes, you have church hurt and somebody will go from one church to another. Sometimes it's so bad that people just determine, I'm not going to church anymore. They're forever jaded by their experience. And really, that's a shame when it gets to that point because people affected by church hurt often lose sight of the fact that you don't go to church for the people. You go to church to worship God. 
right? And it wasn't God that hurt you. It was the people that hurt you. And at the end of the day, no matter what church you go to, no matter where you attend, people are human and people are going to make mistakes. Uh, So we can't have unrealistic expectations of God's people that somehow in the church house that you're just never going to be hurt by someone else. That's just not true. Any group that you go to, any place where there's people, there is the opportunity to probably be hurt by those very people. And so we can't expect that the church is somehow going to be different. So people in the church need grace just as much as anybody else, right? So you have church hurt. That's one reason why people might uh, be disenfranchised by the church. But then you also have people that leave church over a moral downfall in leadership. And so too many pastors end up making the news over issues of sexual misconduct or moral, moral failure. Even in our convention as Southern Baptists, we have shot ourselves in the foot over this very issue. And so as you would expect, this kind of behavior can be a repellent to church life. And rightfully so. People will see the hypocrisy of the leader who is talking the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And so what do they do? They hold their nose, they turn the other direction, and they walk out of the doors of the church. Then lastly, People may have left church life over what I would call extreme doctrine and teaching. This would be in the form of maybe legalism, right? Uh, Legalism will drive people away from churches. Legalism takes issues in the Bible that really aren't spoken directly about or, or not at least to the extent that they take it. And what do they do? They take that line and they move it. Uh, they, they kind of make extreme positions on things that are not really taught explicitly in the Bible, and then they turn them into foundational principles of the faith, that if you don't do these things that the church teaches, that somehow you're just not walking with the Lord as you ought to, right? And so anyway, here's my overarching point. There could be any number of reasons why people will walk away from the church, but really it boils down to one simple fact. People have left the church because far too often the church has failed to be what God intends it to be. That's the bottom line. Do you walk away from anything today and you, you just want to take one nugget? Far too often the church fails to be what God intended it to be. You see, the church at the start in the book of was a beautiful picture of what God desired for his people. But over time, just like human nature, we have taken God's beautiful design and we have marred it. We have made it less than what God had intended for it to be. And over the centuries, you look at church history, we've made a mess of things. We really have. You could read church history book after history book after history book, and there have been splits, there have been divisions, there have been fights, there have been theological debates. I mean, over and over and over again, you have messy things that have happened within church history. But thankfully, as messy as church history can be, And as messy as churches can even be to this day, praise God, we at least have a snapshot of what God intentionally, you know, at least initially designed for his church to be in the book of Acts. So in Acts 2, we have a great picture of what God intended for his church to be. And I want to look at that day today. So Acts chapter 2, picking up in verse 40. And let me just set up the passage for us before we read it. Okay, here is the, the first moment where you get a glimpse of what the church was like right after Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had just descended upon the church, and boom, there they are getting getting into what God had for them to do. And here's the thing. Uh, The beautiful thing is, is even the great picture of what God intended the church to be, don't mishear me on this. The early church was not a perfect church. You all hear that? The early church was not a perfect church. Okay, it's a great picture of what God intended the church to be, but it was not a perfect church. And here's why. The early church was made up of, guess what? People. You know what happens when you have people in the church? You're going to have sin. You're going to have some issues that take place, some rubbing of heads. And so even to this day, newsflash, when there are people in the church, it means that the church is made up of imperfect people, including myself. We are all imperfect people. We are not going to do the right time, the right thing every single time. And so even to this day, I think 
a, a great mantra for the church should be this. Right on 130 on our sign when we renovate it, we should have the tagline, no perfect people allowed, right? I mean, wouldn't that get some attention? Like, wait a second, no perfect people allowed, you know? But anyway, needless to say, all jokes aside, the scripture tells us that we're going to make mistakes. That's why it tells us that we need to bear with one another when we do wrong, that we need to be quick to forgive one another when somebody has misstepped. And so far too often, though, we forget about these things. So here in the book of Acts, they were not a perfect church, and we will find many of such occasions when the church had a misstep. But yet, as imperfect as this early church was, they were still a beautiful picture of of what God can do with broken people. I like to think of it this way. How many are into like, uh, you know, flowers and plants and that kind of stuff? All right. Dana better raise her hand. Yeah, <laughs> she loves a lot of plants. But, <laughs> but no, for those that have flowers, how many of you have some vases at home? You guys have some vases at home? How many of you have like a glass mosaic vase? Have you ever seen that? Where you've got like these little broken shards of glass that they kind of piece together into this beautiful glass vase. You seen that? Deneen seen that? Anyone else see those kind of vases? Well, here's what's cool about that. Think about this. You wouldn't have that beautiful glass mosaic vase if it weren't for the broken pieces of glass that were put together. I feel like that's a really good picture of what the church is. The church is a bunch of broken people. We're sinful and perfect people. But when God puts the church together, and we learn to do the things that God has asked the church to do, we can become like that beautiful vase where God used brokenness. He uses brokenness to make something beautiful. So that's what we have in the book of Acts. You have this imperfect church put together to be this beautiful, beautiful piece of art, right? And even in the midst of this, this difficulty and this sin, we can still find a healthy church. So how do you determine if a church is healthy? That's the question of the day then, right? If God's gonna use imperfect people like you and I and he's going to make a healthy church, well, what, what is a healthy church? Well, here's a couple things. Uh, a lot of people will use these types of metrics. They'll say, well, is your attendance strong? Or are your financials sound? Or how many ministries do you offer? Or, you know, all these different things. And, and I'm not saying that those metrics are bad metrics to look at, but what I would suggest is that none of those create a healthy church. A healthy church is not correlated with how many people attend. It's not correlated with how much money is brought in. It's not correlated with how many activities that you do. But rather, the single most important question that I believe you have to ask when you start to attend a church is this. Is God at work in their church? There it is. Is God at work in the church. And that is the single largest marker of whether or not it is a healthy church. Listen, at Valpo Baptist, even if we could boast in all the metrics that most churches use, it is all for naught if God is not at work in the church. We would be doing nothing but gathering a crowd together on a Sunday morning. And that doesn't accomplish much. Having a crowd does not dictate whether or not you are doing the Lord's work. Because Jesus didn't say, go and get crowds. He said, go make disciples, right? And those disciples are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they learn what Jesus commanded, and they go out and do the same, right? And so at Valpo Baptist, we have to remember that God wants to use us as an imperfect people to be a healthy church to go and do what he has called the church to do. And I would suggest the early church irrefutably had God at work. If you want to look at a church where God was clearly on the move, it was the early church. He used this imperfect gathering of people called the church to go out and reach the world. Think about this. Peter preached a sermon. We looked at that the last few weeks. And as he preached this sermon, what happened? 3,000 souls came to know Christ. Then on top of that, the Bible tells us that the Lord added to their number day by day those that were being saved. So God was clearly at work. And so let's look at this. Acts chapter 2, picking up in verse 40. We're just going to read it together. And verse 40 says this. And with many other words, he testified and he exhorted them saying, uh, be saved from this perverse generation. 
Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together. They had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and their goods. They divided them all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So in the passage, I think there's three things that constitute a healthy church. So let's talk about those together. First, a healthy church loves the Lord. Second, a healthy church loves his people. And third, a healthy church desires to continue God's work in the world. Okay, those are the three essentials in a healthy church. And by the way, I just want to draw a parallel here. Um, How many remember our mission statement? Okay, we always say at Valparaiso Baptist Church, we are a church with a heart, okay, and we have a heart in three areas that we talk about. We want to have a heart for God, a heart for others or people, yep, and a heart for the community. Good job. You guys did better than the 9 a.m. service. I'm going to have to quiz them again next week and say, man, the 11 o'clock had it, all right? So yeah, but notice that there's a lot of parallels. So I think that when we say these are the areas we're aiming for, we're aiming for worthy areas. These are areas that the early church was doing. And let's just take a look at these. A healthy church loves the Lord. Okay, how did they do that? Well, in the passage, first, they love the Lord through the teaching of the word. In verse 42, it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So did you see that? They were continuing in the apostles' doctrine or in their teaching. And so while 3,000 new converts all at once probably would be any pastor's dream, I mean, can you just imagine that? You preach a sermon and 3,000 people respond. That would be kind of cool, but it would also probably be a pastor's nightmare. And here's why. Because in Acts 2, you had all these people coming from different backgrounds, different locations. They were speaking different languages. And and in large part, there was a lot of people that were ignorant of God's word and especially ignorant of who Jesus Christ was. And so just think of the task that the church had. You have 3,000 brand new converts. And what's your job? You have to disciple them. You have to actually, you know, teach them and help them grow. And so That's why they had to have sound doctrine. The apostles were going, and what did they do? They just started to teach sound doctrine. Who was Jesus? What did he do? Why is it important? How do you share this with others? They immediately got straight to the business of teaching doctrine. And I would suggest that doctrine was of great importance to the early church. These new believers were about ready to go back to wherever they came from, and what were they going to do? They were going to share the faith with others. And so they made teaching the word a corner piece of what they did in the church. And unfortunately, we live in a day-to-day where many churches minimize or trivialize sound doctrine. They don't believe that sound doctrine is an important staple to a healthy church. And instead, churches choose to emphasize having an emotional experience or having entertainment as their staple piece. And listen, I'm not saying that you can't enjoy church when you go there or you can't have a little bit of fun. But listen, if that's what church is all about, you've missed the point. Church isn't supposed to be about going and having an entertaining time. Church is about sound doctrine, sound teaching, taking the word of God and expounding upon it. And that's exactly what the early church did. And then you think about like what the Apostle Paul said. When the Apostle Paul wrote Younger Pastors, For instance, pastors like Timothy or Titus, what did he do? He emphasized the need of sound doctrine. I'll give you a good example of this. Right before Paul was going to be martyred for his faith, he was writing Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and here's what he said. He said, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom, 
to do what? Preach the word. Preach the word. That's what Paul said. One of the last things he's going to tell his protege Timothy before he's going to die, and he takes the time to say, I solemnly charge you to preach the word. If there's nothing else that you do as a minister, preach the word. That's why he goes on in the same book, what does he warn Timothy? He warns Timothy that there would be a time where people are no longer going to endure sound doctrine, that they're going to look for teachers that teach things that tickle their ears, that you know, the preachers are going to teach things that everybody wants to hear. And so he says, listen, you need to resist against that. Don't fall for the temptation of only preaching the things that people want to hear because that's not at the heartbeat of what God desires for a church. He wants a church to preach sound doctrine. And sometimes the word of God is going to step on a toe or two, doesn't it? It makes you wish that you wore your steel-toed boots to church that morning because you're like, ouch, you know? And so preaching the word was a, was a fundamental part of loving the Lord. They wanted to love the Lord through the preaching of sound doctrine. They also had a love for the Lord through their corporate worship. If you look at verse 42 again, you'll notice it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and their fellowship, and then in the breaking of bread. Does anybody know what the breaking of bread refers to? Communion. Communion. The breaking of bread, right? It's literally a a reference to the bread and the cup, right? And so why the Lord's Supper? Why did they commit themselves to the Lord's Supper? Well, the Lord's Supper should remind us of the greatest truth in all of Scripture, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, loved us enough to give his life on the cross so that you and I could be reconciled before a holy and righteous God. I'd say that's pretty important. And that's why as Baptists, we have two major ordinances in the church as Baptists. One, we believe in the Lord's Supper as an ordinance of the church. And two, anybody want to take a guess? Baptism, right? Those are two ordinances of the Baptist church. Well, why do we believe that? Because we see it here. In the early church, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread The Lord's Supper was a meaningful thing that they could do to remember the sacrifice that Jesus had made for them. And so to this day, not only did Jesus instruct us to do it, but we do it because we see it as a practice in the early church. They made Lord's Supper a priority and they came together for this corporate worship. They also loved the Lord through their prayer. Okay, once again in verse 42, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So notice, even in their corporate gatherings, they made prayer a priority. We cannot underestimate how valuable prayer is to the corporate body. Prayer is of the utmost essence. Whenever and wherever we meet as a church, whether we're meeting in large meetings, small meetings, small group places, house to house, out at restaurants, whatever, prayer ought to always be woven into the fabric of what we do as a church. And so our corporate gatherings have to have a time of prayer. That's why we always beseech the Lord at the beginning of every service. That's why we always beseech the Lord before we have our time of preaching. We're asking God to be present. We're asking him to be a help as leadership in the church. The leaders ought to be seeking the Lord in prayer. In your own personal life, in your family life, you all ought to be seeking the Lord in prayer as difficulties arise, as different things come up in, in, the, in the stride of life. What do you do? You pray about it, right? Prayer was a, a facet of loving the Lord in the early church. Then lastly, the church also showed their love through their praise and their joy. Look at verse 46. In verse 46, it says, uh, they were, you know, taking their meals together with gladness and with simplicity of heart or sincerity of heart. You see, the early church was marked by its joy. Can you just imagine? They were gathering together in these homes. They were breaking bread. They were praying. They were fellowshipping. And what came from it? They had gladness and simplicity of heart. Have you ever been to church where you just left and you were joyful because you were there, right? That's what church ought to feel like. We come to church and we have gladness in our heart. We have 
simplicity of heart going on because the Lord worked in and through the gathering of the saints. And so that's what's going on. It, it, right there in verse 47, it says they were praising God, right? This, it's this ongoing praising that was going on. And praise and joy was a, a marker of the corporate worship of, of the people there in the early church. Joy literally oozed out of the cracks of their souls, and they couldn't help but have some pep in their step as they went about their day. Man, wouldn't it be cool for us to walk with such joy in our heart that people are like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, why are you so joyful all the time? You know, how can you always be so happy? Wouldn't it be a great testimony to say, how can I not be with the Lord in my life? Isn't that cool? I mean, that would be awesome to have that kind of testimony. I'm just saying. And so they had praise and joy as a part of their love for the Lord. So clearly, a healthy church loves the Lord. And they emphasize these things. But a healthy church also loves God's people. Okay, take a look. In verse 42, it said, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. This is vitally important. Fellowship in the church and getting together with other saints is absolutely essential. Let me share with you how this doesn't make any sense. For those that remove themselves from the corporate body called the church. They say they love God, but they're not a part of any church. Let me just share with you where that rationale breaks down, okay? The church is called the body of what? The body of Christ. Who's the head of the church? Christ himself, right? Christ is the head of his church, and we are his body. So tell me how this makes any sense. For someone to say, I love the head of the church, Christ, but I want nothing to do with his body. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it, when you start to break it down that way? Let me tell you how good this would go in dating life. Imagine a young man got a brand new girlfriend, and that young man tells his girlfriend, I love everything about your face, but I could do without the rest. Do you think that guy would be dating the next day? I don't think so. He might not even be living. You might have to check his pulse after that one, right? It just doesn't make sense to say, I love this part of you, but I don't love the rest of you. In dating life, we would say that's madness. That's a recipe for, you know, disaster. But yet it happens in church life all the time where people say, I love Christ, but I don't love his body. There's a disconnect there. We have to recognize part of loving God is loving his people. God wants us to love his people. And yes, that comes with some difficulty at times because the body is not perfect by any stretch, right? No church is, right? You're not going to find a church that's a perfect church. If you're looking for that, it's unrealistic. But at the same time, the body of Christ, even though the body is not nearly as lovely as Christ himself, the Bible still commands that we should not forsake the assembling together, that we should not forsake that gathering together. That's why the Bible tells us that even in those difficult times when you have some tension or stress with people in the body, the Bible says, forgive one another, bear with one another. You know, if, if somebody offends you, learn to have grace for that situation. And that's what connecting with God's people looks like, that it's sticking with the church even when the church isn't very lovable. And that's really hard to do at times. But yet, we cannot say that we love Christ, the head of the church, but then hate his body. So friends, let's be a forgiving people that loves his church. And so what does that look like to have fellowship with his people? Well, first of all, if you're going to have godly fellowship with, with his people and you're going to love God's people, well, first you have to fellowship with people that are saved, right? I know that sounds obvious, but notice it said that uh, as the fellowship was added to, they were adding those that were being saved. And so to be a part of the fellowship, you need to first be saved. It's hard to have a, a spiritual fellowship without the Spirit, right? It's really hard to have that. In fact, impossible. And so, first of all, you had the people that were being added to the fellowship. How were they added? They were saved. But then secondly, our salvation is a bond that knits us together. Notice that to have godly fellowship, we have to be together. 
And I know I, I'm stating some obvious things here, right? That if we're going to love God's people, first, we have to be God's people. And second, we have to actually spend time together. But you know, that's getting increasingly hard to do in today's society, isn't it? I was just in um, Chicago the other day, went up to go see a, a show up in Chicago. And as I uh, was walking around the streets of Chicago, it dawned on me how busy and driven people are. They are so about their own business that they have tunnel vision. People are walking in Chicago and man, they're just, they're like speed walking. You know, you try to wave or say hello and they're like, I'm going to put my earbuds in. Like, I don't have time to listen to you. I've got my mission. You know, and we get like that, don't we? We get so busy with the schedule that we forget to acknowledge the people around us. And so part of church life is being together. And so if you come to church only on Sunday mornings and you avoid any other fellowship with church folk, you are missing a big piece of the picture. We were never intended to only come to a Sunday morning service. We were intended to love each other, to fellowship with one another, to really bond with others. And you have to sometimes put yourself in an uncomfortable situation to go out and get to know somebody. So don't be afraid to go and have some fellowship. Go from house to house. Go to restaurant to restaurant. Get involved in a small group, right? I would venture to say that you will never truly enjoy the fellowship that God intends for you until you take time to spend time with God's people. You have to take time for that. Relationships are not formed on a once a, once a week acquaintance, you know, high and by at church. Relationships are formed in those deep, meaningful conversations. I think of some of my favorite times with many of you in the church. My favorite times with you are not the times where we just shake hands on a Sunday, but when I invite someone to my home or you invite me into your home or we've gone out to eat together, or gone out to coffee together, or we had dessert together, right? Those are the times where when I think of God's people, man, I love that intimate time where I can get to know somebody better, way more deep than just a simple handshake on a Sunday and hello, right? We have to love one another and be together. We have to spend time together. But then godly fellowship also means that we take care of each other. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, it's a pretty extreme case of taking care of each other, but nonetheless, they did. It says that all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods, and they divided them all among themselves as anyone had need. Let me just state this unequivocally. The church, the church must take care of those that are less fortunate around us. It's, it's essential. A church needs to be marked by how it cares for the most vulnerable around us. And thank the Lord, you know, Valpo Baptist is such a generous church, and we have seen that time and time and time again. When a need arised, you all have tried to meet that need to the best of your ability, and I am so appreciative of that because, friends, the Bible teaches that we need to take care of one another. If a brother or sister is in need of the basics of life, we need to try to find food for them, find shelter for them, find clothing for them, right? Be quick to share the blessing that God has bestowed upon you to help those that are a little less fortunate. And so thank the Lord that our church aims to do that, but let's keep that up. Let's never be a church that forgets that if God is generous to our church, we need to be generous to others as well. Then lastly, a healthy church continues God's work in the world. Now notice that the passage doesn't directly say that they devoted themselves to evangelism. So it's kind of interesting. It's not directly stated, but here's what I do know. That is in fact what was happening. Because think about this. The church isn't added to day by day those that are being saved unless people are sharing the gospel, right? Right? You're only going to see salvations if somebody has the gumption to speak up and say something, to actually share the gospel. And that's what they were doing. They were going out and they were sharing. And when they went back to their hometown, their home area, what did they do? They shared there too. And that's why the church is growing leaps and bounds by the thousands. People are coming to know Christ because they had the joy in their heart from the Lord. And they went out and they had to share that with others. 
And I think that's, at the end of the day, what matters for a church. We are called to continue God's work in the world around us, starting here in Valparaiso and going to even the ends of the earth. We have a job to do. And so a healthy church goes out and shares the gospel. A healthy church goes out and and tries to make a difference in the community around them by sharing what God can do in people's life, that Jesus loves them so much that he was willing to go to the cross for them. And so friends, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved in the early church. And I would suggest that when you and I go out there and share the gospel, guess what? The Lord's church is going to get added to, right? Because it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for anyone who believes. Amen? So friends, that is what makes a healthy church. If you're ever wondering what does Mitch think a healthy church is, you can remember this message. Okay, I put my stamp of approval. You can quote me any part of this message, and I'm okay with it, except for maybe the whole, you know, boyfriend telling the face thing, you know, because if you take that out of context, that would sound really weird. But the rest of it, I'll put my stamp on it, okay? But here's the thing. A healthy church loves the Lord. A healthy church loves the Lord through the teaching of the word, through corporate worship, and through prayer. A healthy church also loves God's people right? How does that happen? Well, first, you have to be part of God's people. You have to be saved. Then you have to be together. Then you have to take care of those that are less fortunate around you. Then lastly, a healthy church continues God's work all around the world. How does that happen? Share the gospel by telling of the joy that you found in Christ, starting here in Valparaiso and going even to the ends of the earth. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we reflect upon the message today. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray today that our church would be characterized by these qualities. It's so easy for churches to look at the metrics that don't really matter. Lord, it's fine to have good attendance. It's fine to have financials coming in. It's fine to have programs and different get-togethers and all that. All that is, is fun, but it's not really what matters most. What matters most is being a church that exudes these three qualities, that they love you with their whole heart, that they love your church, and that they go out to spread the gospel to the world. So Father, I pray that Valparaiso Baptist Church would always remember what marks a healthy church. And Lord, there are certainly areas that as I preach this message, I recognize there are areas we could do better in as a church. I could be better as a pastor. And so Lord, forgive us corporately as a church where we fall short of these ideals and these standards. Lord, we know that you gave us the early church as a picture of what you desired for your church. And so Father, when we fall short, Forgive us and help us to make progress in those areas. And so, Father, we love you today. We pray that you were honored through the preaching of the word this morning. And we pray, Lord, that Valpo Baptist would be a healthy church. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. If you need to pray this morning, this time is between you and the Lord. It's your time to, to pray or to respond.
you may be seated. Real quickly, let me share with you just a couple quick announcements. So hang tight here. And then we're going to have a baptism service here in just a second. So one, uh, we are looking for vacation Bible school workers. That's coming up here at the very beginning of August. Uh, we're trying something a little bit different. Instead of a whole five-day week, it's going to be a shortened three-day thing. It'll be a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Thursday and Friday are going to be our normal VBS evening hours. And Saturday is going to be a big family day for families to come out and enjoy it together. And so if you're interested in helping us with VBS, we would love for you to do that. You can sign up a couple different ways. One, if you go to the info desk and use the tablet, it is on our event registration page there. You can sign up on those tablets. Two, you can go to valpobaptist.org and you can find it there. Or if you wait till this afternoon and you're on our text message system, you're going to be getting a text about it this afternoon. And so if you just click the link uh, associated with that text, 